Thank you. We talked this morning and earlier today about geopolitics and geoeconomics. I'm going to be adding this third element, which is geophysical change. So if you thought we had problems before, <laughs> just wait. Um, the reason uh, geophysical change is an issue is because as humans, uh, we tend to build into the environment that's already there. So I'm not quite sure how this works. Where do I point it? Just push it. Okay, so if you look at defense installations from different locations built at different times in different parts of the world, you'll see they look basically the same. If you want to defend your location, you want a high vantage point overlooking a large plain, uh, you want a water supply because if you don't have a water supply, then it's a death trap. So what you end up seeing is forts on mountaintops, you often end up with religious installations there in case your war doesn't go so well, you'll have both. <laughs> um, but we build into the environment that is already there. So understanding that is key to understanding the problems we're going to be having going forward. And you know that very well here. This is Camden in 1855. Camden, Camden is a, a physical gift to humanity. You have the mountain. <laughs> yeah. You have the mountain overlooking the harbor. You have this incredible river that can provide fresh water, can provide power, can provide the power for the mills, which creates the economic activity. Um, so apart from simply being beautiful, it's incredibly useful as a location. It was inevitable, given the topography of the region, that Camden would become Camden. And you know, the sailing's pretty good, too. This sort of building into the geography that you have around you is part of the way we as humanity develop, expand, and provide economic activity. We have a real problem, for example, with where to build airports. Airports require a large amount of flat land. So that means usually they're either in a, in a river valley or they're on the coast. These are uh, uh, Hong Kong Airport and LaGuardia Airport. If you are concerned about environmental change in any way, this, this is not a good thing. <laughs> and the result is, when you look at airports around the world, they're turning more into ports than airports. They're flooding all over the place. This is a, a real logistical problem. I, I work a lot more in the sort of defense and security side. And while this is true on the civilian side, on the defense and security side, we also have a lot of installations in very, very bad locations. So just last month, uh, the uh, DOD put out uh, a little report of climate change impacts, potential climate change impacts on military installations around the United States. Um, th these are, every dot here is a U.S. military installation that has already reported problems from flooding, extreme temperatures, wind, drought, wildfire. And we see what that means on the ground. You know, this is, report just said, half of the U.S. military sites are vulnerable to climate change, and these are examples of installations that have flooded. And if the installation has flooded, that means it's in a location that's already having problems. So uh, the homestead, for example, uh, was destroyed by a hurricane in Florida. The resources that would have gone from that base to help the local community ended up being sucked up by that base in order to secure the personnel and the facilities and the equipment. The same thing with Keesler. Keesler was right next to New Orleans and it was hit by Katrina. They had to scramble the planes, they had to evacuate the personnel. So not only do they become not a net security provider, they become a security sink. And we're seeing this all over the US, but increasingly all over the world. This new factor of including environmental change or geophysical change is uh, forcing a reevaluation of how you do strategic analysis, which is what I do. But it's very important to bear in mind that this isn't just climate change. So every red line here is a hurricane track that's hit the US Gulf Coast in the last, well, until, about, until Katrina. You build in a hurricane track, you're going to be hit by a hurricane at some point. Right? New Orleans was hit by Katrina at about uh, a three. It wasn't a huge hurricane. It wasn't a surprise. But 
New Orleans had engineered itself in a way to become increasingly vulnerable. It had pumped out groundwater, it had built bad levees, it had built on floodplains, and so it created a vulnerability that wasn't there before, and even without climate change, it would be a problem. So, if you're doing a strategic analysis, which, which is what I'm supposed to do, um, I now try to look at geopolitical, geoeconomic, and geophysical change to make sure I'm not missing anything. Might not be a factor, but if it is a factor, I want to know. We missed a very, very big one by uh, not looking at geophysical change when it came to this. Who knows what, what this is? Yeah, it's China's first icebreaker, ice strength and ship. And in the strategic community, I mean, in, including in Canada, 20 years ago, if you'd asked if China was going to be a proto-Arctic power, it's now declared an Arctic silk route. I didn't know there were a lot of silk worms up in the Arctic. Um, you know, you, you would not have potentially been taken seriously. But if you look at China geopolitically, which is uh, sort of it's, it's going out and has been going out for 20 years, uh, economically, it can certainly afford shipbuilding and it's looking at securing, using its navy to secure shipping routes. And the geophysical change in the Arctic, it's almost inevitable that China would end up looking at the Arctic very aggressively. So including that component, for me, has been very helpful. Now the question is, what does that mean? Okay. And that has to do a little bit with your perceptions, and uh, Evan spoke about this this morning uh, very eloquently about how perceptions can, uh, can influence behavior. Um, uh, we call these these geopolitical articles of faith. The, the acronym is GAF, because we all make these GAFs, all make these mistakes. And the basic premise is, we might all have the same strategy securing our borders, healthy economy, that sort of stuff. Or if you're a Buddhist and Anglican and a Catholic, it might be a good life and an even better life after death. But if you ask the Buddhist, that might mean being a vegetarian. If you ask the Catholic, that might mean no fish on Friday. If you ask the Anglican, that might mean gefilte fish, or I don't know, I'm not good on theology. <laughs> uh, but the basic premise is, you know, based on the way you look at the world and what your assumptions are, it's going to affect your analysis, which is going to affect your behavior. And we have some very big questions, again, many of which were brought up this morning, which, depending on where you are on the spectrum, your analysis is going to, is going to change. And one of the biggest ones is, will China's economy grow, stagnate, or contract by 2022? Now, I picked 2022 because the current leadership, barring a comet strike, is likely going to be in power until 2022. So their vector is, is pretty set. Um, but we don't know, as again was brought up this morning, whether their economy will continue its growth rate. So just by applause, who think China's economy might contract by 2022? Yeah. Who thinks it will the rate will stay the same or grow between now and 2022. Okay. So, so the, the second hand clappers, you agree with the Australian strategic community. Okay. So the Australian strategic community decided, uh, and not all of them, a, a lot of the, especially defense and intelligence community is very concerned about China, but the uh, particularly political and business community has made this decision that China's economy will continue to grow and that Australia needs to ride the dragon and it's had definite strategic consequences. Um, one of the major defense analysts in Australia is this guy called Hugh White and he wrote this book not that long ago called The China Choice, Why America Should Share Power. It was a, a discussion about how the US and China should share the Pacific he was not uh, specific about who should get the Philippines or Vietnam or Japan or any of our other allies, um, but he was pretty uh, clear that uh, China was going to continue to grow, and from an Australian perspective, it may be more of an Asian country than a part of the West. We've had several Australian prime ministers come out and say things similar to, Australia should cut the tag with American foreign policy. He used Trump as an excuse, but he was already pushing this line beforehand. 
This is uh, a real problem for, for us. Uh, for a, one of the reasons that Avril mentioned earlier in terms of the importance of multilateral institutions, Australia is a Five Eyes intelligence sharing partner with the West. Australia isn't just Australia from a defense and security perspective. It, it is a key component of the way that we interact with the Pacific and with Indonesia and with very large tracts of that zone. So our multilateral agreement in that case has been extremely helpful for us for 50, 60 years. But if Australia starts to weaken, we have a problem. And the Chinese are very happy for us to have a problem. And so they've been looking at ways of accelerating that. Uh, the Australian political system allows overt foreign donations to political candidates. Um, so a uh, Chinese government official can come up and give a suitcase full of cash to an Australian politician and it's legal. Um, the Australian Attorney General made a little visit to DC a few months ago where the Americans said maybe that's not such a great idea. So they may be rewriting the law. But we need to start to rethink how these changing dynamics that we talked about this morning can be cascading through very large and very important defense and security architecture. We are seeing it affect positioning already. Australia gave the US a bit of a hard time about stationing 1,500 troops in Darwin, which is on the north, north coast of Australia. It then leased the entire port of Darwin to a Chinese government company. That port is right next to where the Americans are stationed. This, this ambiguity in positioning is extremely problematic. And it's based on the assumption in a large section of the Australian community that China's economy will continue to grow. Okay, so it's always worth, in, in many of our discussions today and in moving forward, going back to those starting premises to make sure you really feel confident about them. If you do, great. If not, it's worthwhile having several pathways to look at what that means. Another one that's a really big question now is will the US militarily defend Indo-Pacific allies in a time of crisis? Again, this is something that was uh, talked about, uh, again, actually in Avril's presentation, about this incrementalism and uh, where do you cross the line in order to respond? So the Chinese have been building the islands. They've been militarizing the islands. They've been pushing boats into Japanese waters. They've been testing the limits of the US. At what point does the US respond if it responds? Now, there are a lot of countries in the region that have concerns about whether the US will respond. Another Australian, uh, another Australian prime, former prime minister has overtly said that America will not protect us. Now, what that's me what's that meant is, and this is something Evan brought up, is that you're starting to see much more of a push towards diversification of defense. Um, relationships, uh, which is where this Indo-Pacific concept is coming up. And it's worth taking a look at what the Indo-Pacific actually is. This is a map that I find particularly useful. So um, if you use this map, because we, we're used to Eurocentric maps, right, where the, where the Pacific is cut off at the edges and it's way off on the far sides. It's literally at the edge of our strategic map when we use that map. When you use this map, you can see that the economies, the growing economies of India, China, the potentially strong economies of South America, the still and will be for a long time American economy is very strong. The increasing access potentially through the Bering Strait, this zone is highly active. If the 20th century was the Atlantic century, it's very likely the 21st century is the Indo-Pacific century. So what does that mean if you think, if your gaffe is that the US may not be your sole security provider? What you're, what you're starting to see is more push towards things like um, uh, a broader security uh, construct, which the Australians call the Indo-Pacific, and the Japanese tend to call the security diamond. They're fundamentally based on the same four countries, at least initially, which is the US mostly based out of Hawaii, Japan, Australia, and India, 
which is worth talking about a little bit more. Parts of that triangle have much stronger bilateral relationships, which are happening quickly and quietly. For example, this is just announced not that long ago. Um, this is from an Indian newspaper, a lakh is 100,000. So Japan is paying for 300,000 young Indians to go and spend three to five years in Japan. That's, that's strategic, right? They want 300,000 Japanese-speaking Indians, because I guess they don't think 300,000 Japanese are going to learn Hindi. Uh, so they're bringing them over, and they're trying to create a bridge, um, which, and this is mostly for tech training, upon which they can build a stronger strategic alliance. Similarly, and, and again, this is why India is so important, especially even to the Japanese, India is the only country-specific cell within the Pentagon. This is to speed up defense cooperation, sales, interoperability. Right? So this Indian component of the Indo-Pacific is incredibly important to uh, creating another architecture if, again, you're not sure the US alone will defend you, but you want to facilitate US allies in order to create a, a strategic zone that is much more favorable. I was in uh, Delhi last month for the Ricina Dialogue. This was the quad on stage in Delhi last month. These are uh, top naval commanders from Japan. That's the chief of staff, Japan, Vice Admiral Barrett from um, Australia, um, uh, Admiral Lambda from India, and of course, Harris from uh, US PACOM. Harris has just been appointed as the next US ambassador to Australia. This, and, and interestingly for quad watchers, uh, the Indians made sure to put an Indonesian on stage because there's a move to try to make it a quad plus three where you include Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Philippines. So it, you know, who knows what's gonna stick, who knows what's not gonna stick, but it's moving, okay? Now, what does this mean for our geophysical stuff? Okay, let's throw in this new element. We just talked about geopolitics and geoeconomics. What about our third geo? Part of the problem with our third geo is just like our physical infrastructure, just like our airports assume that the environment we built into won't change, our legal infrastructure assumes that the environment it governs will not change. And that's true with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Very useful document. It has some flaws. This is one of them. If you have a very boring rectangular country, you get 200 nautical miles off your coastline. If it floods and retreats, it's unclear whether your coastline will retreat along with it. Similarly, if you have an island off your coast, in this case, country A has island A, it can deviate into B. If that island disappears, what happens to that border? Okay, so we have a situation now where we're talking about entire islands disappearing, potentially. So if you have this island, it can claim a 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone around it, which is why you're seeing this sort of thing. Not <laughs> very unfortunate Chinese soldiers who did something naughty, but they are uh, potentially claiming 200 nautical miles around that rock, okay, island, for China, okay? So the Chinese aren't particularly satisfied with just this, even they don't, you know, want to give their soldiers a bit more respect. So they've been building islands at a very quick rate. You can see this is a fiery cross. Within about a year and a half, they went from that top photo to the bottom photo. That is, to my mind, because of my gaffes, clearly a defense installation. So what does that mean for this uh, venerable island chain defense concept, which was gone, which has been quite influential since at least the 50s, where if you want to contain initially the Soviet Union, but now it's China, you need to control the first island chain, second island chain, and third island chain. And you're already seeing new islands appearing in the first island chain, right? What does that mean about the third island chain, which is less discussed, but is actually the front line between Asia and the Americas. A lot of the islands have this kind of elevation. It, it doesn't take much for them to go away, 
But each of these little islands gets a 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone around them. This is not an empty zone. This is a, a map of the Pacific with exclusive economic zones included. Okay? Everything that is red is outright United States. Okay? The United States has the largest exclusive economic zone on the planet. Any guess who has the second largest exclusive economic zone on the planet? France. <laughs> okay? This is France, this is France, this is France, and this is France. And, and these are militarized zones. They have bases there left over from their nuclear testing. So when you talk about a nuclear, or you talk about a submarine sale between France and Australia, they share a maritime border. And you're starting to see France be much, much more engaged in a, in a naval way. France was all over that Ricina Dialogue uh, meeting in Delhi. There was a track 1.5 between India and France and a track 1.5 between India, France, and Australia. So watch for these post-EU foreign policies developing out of European countries, and in particular, France. It's moving very quickly. So, bringing this all together, what does it mean? Let's take a close-up look at one little section of these islands, okay? We'll take a look at Kiribati. Kiribati, it's, it's spelled Kiribati, but it's pronounced Kiribati. Long story. So, it's in three sections. It has a population of 100,000 people. It covers as much of the planet as India very large exclusive economic zone, and each one of them comes up against a little piece of the US. I know that's, that's not really technically the US, but there are bases there. And it has been an issue, because when they were aligned with China, they set up, China set up a tracking station in Kiribati to monitor activity in the Marshall Islands. And the US said, maybe that's not such a great idea. So Kiribati switched political alignment to Taiwan and shut down the tracking station. But with rising sea levels and possible population movements, after it switched to Taiwan, now it may have to move its entire population to Fiji. And it's been preparing for that. It's bought land in Fiji. Fiji has a very good relationship with China. Very, very close, in part because of mismanagement by Australia and New Zealand of the relationship. So the question then becomes, if they have to move their population to Fiji, Will Fiji say, you know what, maybe I think you should also let us put our bases back? So if we don't include this geophysical component, we may miss elements of developing strategic vulnerabilities. May not happen, but we should at least consider it. China has shown that it is very good at planning long term in this sort of arena. But <laughs> I'd just like to say, when you're dealing with China, just because you have a long-term plan, it doesn't mean it's any good. <laughs> okay? And you can see that domestically in China, Shanghai is, who's been to Shanghai? Okay, anybody who's flown into Shanghai, you notice the elevation or, or lack thereof? Yeah, it is basically like New Orleans. It's in an active delta, it's subsiding, it's in a typhoon pathway. The name Shanghai means above sea, which means there was a lot of sea and not a lot of Shanghai. Okay? <laughs> but they built on it and built on it and built on it and put chemical plants all the way up and down the coast either side of it. And so what you're seeing is this is a list of evacuations from China's southeast coast just between 2005, 2015, and then I got like bored. But uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, every summer are being evacuated off the coast out of the way of typhoon pathways. And in some cases, like in, in 2011, there was a serious case of a potential breach of a chemical containment pool, which had political consequences. So China may be good at looking at the Arctic and figuring out there's a geophysical change opportunity there, but domestically it's leaving itself open to a lot of vulnerabilities. So, what's the point? The point is geography makes history, but right now environmental change is remaking geography. And we need to start to incorporate it financially, geopolitically, economically, whatever, if we want to continue to have a nice, stable-ish world. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. 
Well, that was great, uh, Cleo, and I really feel like I learned something. I felt like it was like being back at school and really learning something, and my parents... There's no quiz. There's no quiz. <laughs> that's, that's the best kind of school. My parents, who were professors of geography at BU for three decades, would be you know, sitting in the front row clapping at everything you said. So I feel like the takeaway that I personally got from your talk was um, that climate and um, geographic, geological change, I mean, not geological, but climate science changes are really affecting our national security, our politics, everything. So with that in mind, um, given that we're, we've made an announcement to withdraw from the Paris Treaty, um, is that it? Are we all sunk now? We're dead. Or is there a way to sort of claw back from that and do something that will, you know, literally save our planet? Because what you put up there was pretty disturbing in many ways. You know, lack of not only if places get flooded and water levels rise and entire islands or cities disappear and chemical plants get breached. You get the picture, guys. Pretty depressing stuff. Yeah. Um, and water shortages, all sorts of things. So how can we claw back from the position we're in now? Uh, so there are a lot of environmental change impacts, obviously. Um, and um, uh, the uh, withdrawing from the climate agreement doesn't necessarily mean uh, a, that uh, ultimate emissions are going to change, or that B, emissions is going to be a determining factor in a lot of the other things that I spoke about, just because of what's the inertia that's built into the climate change system, but also because of these other environmental change factors. So you'll get, um, you know, saltwater intrusion to groundwater anyway. You'll get, you know, I'm, in fact, what I would like to see in terms of U.S. national security, you can look at, uh, at the Paris Agreement, but also please look at the National Flood Insurance Program. Mm. You know, look at, look at programs that are assuming that the environment will be static and that build these physical and economic vulnerabilities into the system. The farm subsidies assume that the same crops will be growing in the same location forever. You know, there's the, a lot of the um, uh, insur zoning that is tied to insurance is facilitated because of these externalities that are not included in the calculations of the risk. So there are a lot of different things that can happen. And uh, part of it is figuring out in your own sector, your own area, it's much like we heard about in politics before, uh, figuring out what, what you can do to make sure that you've included it to uh, be an agent of uh, resilience in a time of vulnerability and variability, as opposed to um, going for something that may not be realistic right now and losing sight of the fact that there's a lot we can just do on a daily basis to make sure that our house isn't going to flood, you know, our water will be drinkable, that sort of stuff. <laughs>